you feel that you can't speak to anyone, remember, there's help for you. Contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. You're never alone. and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lupus podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Friday, September 17th, 2021. Today's episode is about medical errors, depression, and hypothyroidism. Rising suicide for black girls, drugging in nursing homes, and last but not least, you'll hear what my biopsy results revealed. So, you know what I want you to do. That's right, all the way from the United States to Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I love you guys. So get ready to grab your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, and to my listeners late at night. Now, you know I appreciate you, so go ahead while you grab your buddy, your listening partner. Go grab your favorite glass of wine. And come on and join the conversation right here on My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. Let's get started. And what we're going to talk about first is medical error. Do you know what medical errors are? And did you know? that it is a book that is called Medical Era. When I was in college, I did a paper on this same topic, Medical Errors. Now, according to the book, Medical Era, it is defined as preventable adverse effect of medical care, whether or not it is evident or harmful to the patient. Once again, according to the book, Medical Era, it is defined as preventable adverse effect of medical care, whether or not It is evident or harmful to the patient. Now, we as patients, you may not even know a medical error has taken place. And even if you do know about it, the medical error may not negatively affect you in any way. However, many medical errors are quite serious and can even result in death. 
Now, according to data provided by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, one in seven patients on Medicare in a hospital setting is a victim of medical error. A John Hopkins study released in 2016 estimated roughly 250,000 people die annually. That's right, because of medical errors. That would make medical errors the third leading cause of death here in the United States behind only heart disease and cancer. Now, it should be noted that the annual death rate from medical errors um, is based on a smaller pool of data. Some studies indicate that death from medical errors could even be higher due to the way medical errors are reported on death certificates. Now, do you honestly think that they would honestly report a medical error on a death certificate? Say for instance, if I was the surgeon and we went into surgery and I operated on your abdomen, and right before closing up, you counted all the sponges that would, you know, soak the blood up or whatever. But you miscounted. And after um, applying sutures or staples, you notice that you're two sponges short. The surgeon is gone. The patient has gone up to their room for recovery. But the patient starts to experience a high fever and is in pain. So they call the doctor. And the doctor may say, oh, give the patient um, antibiotics or um, something to bring the temperature down. But the OR nurse or tech fail to mention, to run that physician down and fail to mention that there are two sponges short, and it must be in the patient's body. Now, through the night, the patient's conditions worsens. And all of a sudden, the patient colds and dies. What do you think that they will put on the death certificate of that patient. Now, don't forget, the patient has two sponges left in their abdomen, but they failed to inform the surgeon that these sponges were left. Another instance, say you go in for, I'm just using this as an example, um, what can we say now? Um, a hernia. But on the medical chart, it says something totally different, amputation. Did anyone notice 
that you have two patients with the same name and the same birthday, but it's different years and they are both admitted on the same floor. So you take the wrong patient down and um, they are the ones that operated on. Now the patient can't say anything because the patient, they gave a relaxant and the patient is going in and out. Medical errors could be anything. It could be anything. Now some studies indicate that death from medical errors could be even higher as stated before. Now, high risk medical errors. Sometimes medical error poses little physical risk to a patient, such as getting billed for a procedure that didn't take place. True enough, that is an error. But the first thing that pops in my mind, someone is trying to commit fraud. Other times, the consequences are life or death, and those types of high-risk medical errors typically occur in fast-paced, high-pressure environments such as hospital emergency rooms, hospital intensive care units, and operating rooms in the hospital. But that doesn't mean medical errors can't happen at your care provider's office or other outpatient settings. Now, a medical error is a misdiagnosis. Now, when I went into the hospital for my biopsy, the nurse kept stating that, Miss Hendricks, you have hypertension. What medication are you on for hypertension? And she said this, no joke, 10 times. And I got upset. And I said, I keep telling you, I do not have hypertension, high blood pressure. I have pulmonary hypertension, but she didn't state pulmonary hypertension or hypertension where your blood pressure is high due to um, your cholesterol or your lifestyle, um, your dietary lifestyle. Now, Billing errors, I would not call that a medical error. I call that um, an error that's either, either placed on the medical biller or the doctor um, indicated the wrong procedure code on the day sheet, okay? Now, incorrect medications, that is a medical error. Incorrectly identifying a patient, that is a medical error. And surgical errors. Now, when it comes down to misdiagnosis, Misdiagnosis occurs when a patient with one illness or disease is told they have a different illness or disease. Now, according to a 2014 study, roughly 12 million Americans are misdiagnosed at outpatient facilities each and every year. Um... Of the 12 million total Americans receiving a misdiagnosis, roughly 50% could be seriously harmed.
by getting the wrong diagnosis as shown in the chart. Here is another serenial. I went into the hospital because I was receiving excruciating pain um, to the right upper quadrant. It was my liver, okay. I don't drink, never have um, consumed liquor. I don't do recreational drugs because taking what these physicians prescribe to me is enough. I don't need another um, headache. But the doctor in the hospital, not my doctor, another doctor in the hospital stated that I was an alcoholic due to the scarring that was on my liver. So another doctor, it was a female doctor that came in. She went over my records. She went into my electronic medical records and read everything thoroughly and stated, no, the reason why her liver is scarred is due to the lupus attacking her liver. My liver was so scarred that it looked like a presumed alcoholic's liver. So they went back and forth on that. Now, according to a study that analyzed more than 300 medical claims between 2007 and 2013, the following health issues were the most commonly misdiagnosed. Stroke, heart attack, spinal epidural abscess, pulmonary embolism, um, and meningitis, testicular torsion, um, lung cancer, fractures, and appendix. Some of these may not sound very familiar dressed up in the medical terminology. So they are described in everyday layman's terms, a spinal epidural abscess is infected fluid and germs on the spinal cord. Um, and it can be deadly. It is harder to diagnose because two of the main symptoms, fever and back pain, fever and back pain would tell you what? What would pop in your mind if you had fever and back pain? Would it be kidney issue or UTI? What you think? Tell me what you think. Now, pulmonary embolisms are commonly referred to as, that's right, blood clot in one or both lungs. These can be deadly if not diagnosed and treated in time. In fact, roughly one third of all people who have this condition and have not been diagnosed or treated will die. This condition is also tough to diagnose if someone already has heart or lung disease. Now, Meningitis is a bacterial infection that infects, that affects the brain and spinal cord. It can be easily misdiagnosed since the symptoms match up nearly identical with what? The flu. This too can be deadly, a deadly disease if not treated quickly. So you see where? We're going with medical errors. That's why I tell you to always be sure to 
question and it never hurts to let your doctor know. I'm going to put my recorder on on my phone so I don't forget what you're saying. So when I go back home, I can tell my husband or children or my better half what exactly you said. And then everything would be in context and nothing misunderstood. Stay with me. I'll be right back. If you would like to receive your Begin Within a Daily Healing Journal, go on over to Begin Within Today at https colon forward slash forward slash begin within today dot com and use the discount code lupus warrior that's lupus l u p u s warrior w a r r i o r and all capital letters to get your 10% off thank you for joining me back Look, there was an article written in, um, let me get it right. Let me find, okay, met page today on this same topic, medical errors. Okay, now, in this article, one patient told Med page today that she was shocked to read in her PCP's visit summary that she was a binge drinker. Now, look, this is what she actually told her doctor. She told him that she um, consumed alcohol when she was out with friends. So how could she he perceive that she was a binge drinker and the only time that she consumed alcohol was when she was out with friends. Now she asked another provider in the same practice to delete that phrase. But she hasn't checked whether her request was implemented. Another patient's physician note said she had undergone a course of antibiotics and nasal sprays for a cough that were ineffective when those were never prescribed or tried. Now, The reporter was not able to see her own physician's recent visit summary notes through two of her doctor's health portals. And when she did get copies by mail forwarded by her PCP, they were full of errors. There was a drug on the active medication list that hadn't been taken in years and symptoms listed that weren't even discussed or didn't exist. Now, further into this article um, in MedPage, it states that a problem that resolved 20 years ago was listed as current assessment. One report listed an ICD-10 code R63.4 for abnormal weight loss as one of her problems when, as she told her doctor, she had been aggressively 
dieting and exercising for three months on advice of her PCP and had lost 30 pounds. Now, there is and there exists substantial body of literature highlighting medical record errors as well. In a a study published last year by JAMA, um, a deaconess, I'm sorry, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and colleagues surveyed patients who were asked to access their notes from any of three health systems. The response rate was a low 21.7%, but 21% of those who did read their notes saw a mistake, and 42% of them thought the error was serious. The errors included wrong body part, wrong side, stating not BRCA1 positive, reason for visit, pain in hand, not mentioned, wrong patient, not listing history, and so on. But in one record, and this is unbelievable, believable, there was a reference to a female's left testicle. Now, to quantify the problem in one health system, University of Illinois researchers coached undercover patients with a problem script and equipped them to covertly record their encounters with 36 physicians of a VA health system. Their 2020 report found 636 documentation errors, including 181 charted findings that did not take place. Now you see why I say it is so important for you to have copies of your medical records so you can go over everything. Now, some 21 notes justified um, a higher billing level with 40 office visits at a level four rather than the 23 justified by the audio recording, a 74% inflated misrepresentation. A third study in the Journal of American Medical Informatics Association in 2019 implemented an open notes system at two hospitals and a multi-state hospital network between August 2014 and March 2017. Of the 1,440 patients and family reports, 27% contained a potential inaccuracy. Patients and families indicated the inaccuracy was important or very important in 58% of those reports, most of which were related to an incorrect description of symptoms, past problems, or medication lists. Or they noticed important information was missing. What are your thoughts on medical errors? 
Now, do you see why it is so important to get your medical records and go over them? Our next topic is, is hypothyroidism depression linked as strong as we think? What do you think? It may be time to reconsider the paradigm of a strong connection, researchers say. As reported in MedPage, there was a link between hypothyroidism and clinical depression. Although the association was modest and possibly limited to women, according to a systematic review and meta-analysis, the meta-analysis of 25 studies um, reported by Dr. Christopher Bayfeach, MD of the University uh, in, of Ger Germany, I'm sorry, and colleagues. Subgroup analysis found depression was more strongly associated with overt hypothyroidism. And the association was strongest in females and non-significant in males. In this systematic review and meta-analysis, the effect size for the association between hypothyroidism and clinical depression was considerably lower than previously assumed, and the modest association was possibly restricted to overt hypothyroidism and female individuals. It may be time to reconsider the paradigm of a strong connection between hypothyroidism and depression. The results of other groups and or own findings indicate the contributions of hypothyroidism to the pandemic of depression is probably small. The article states this is good news for patients with hypothyroidism or in particular with thyroid autoimmunity. In counseling, um, they may not be able to rule out depression as a comorbidity, but it is not looming large as a very likely threat. The study also found a weak and inconclusive link between autoimmunity, defined as thyroid, peroxidized antibody positivity, and clinical depression. Possibly, it is not the disturbance of the immune system that explains the comorbidity. Hypothyroidism may work differently, the researchers said, noting that many chronic disorders increase the risk for depression in an unspecified way. Regarding research, it appears autoimmunity is not a forceful driver of effective symptoms, they added. A more promising link seems to be the level of thyroid hormones and disturbances of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal. The meta-analysis included epidemiological and population-based 
studies on the association of hypothyroidism and depression. Stay with me. When we come back, we'll be talking about suicides rising for black girls. So stay with me. Deceived from within, living with APS and lupus by author Darren Radke. To purchase his inspirational book, go to www.deceivedfromwithin.com. In the African American community, some of us have been taught what goes on between, in between these four walls stay. Um, and some of us had been taught that we could go to our parents or older siblings for anything. But normally there are those in the African-American community that you don't discuss your problems with a therapist or a psychiatrist. You just deal with it. But what is going on with our Black girls today. Did you know that suicide rates among black girls have been rising in recent years? Did you know that it is increasing at an average of 6.6% annually from 2003 to 2017. In a recent study that was published on Thursday in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent psychiatry found that just over 1,800 black children died by suicide between 2003 and 2017. And while most of the deaths were among boys, especially those 15 to 17, the gender gap is narrowing. The suicide rate of girls increased an average of 6.6% each year, more than twice the increase for boys, the study stated. In an article published by Mad in America, Science, Psychiatry, and Social Justice, Nearly 40% of the girls were 12 to 14 years old, indicating that this age group may need additional attention or different types of intervention. The experiences of the African American child are like none other in the United States, stated LaVon Robinson, a clinical, clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at DuPaul University in Chicago, who has studied suicidal in Black adolescents. 
You know, we live in a society that marginalizes us more so probably than any other group and has historically for years. In the black community, suicide as we typically define it remains rare. The question that we should be asking is, why is it that their will to live was so weak or not strong enough to prohibit them from engaging in those very risky behaviors? Suicide is real within the black community and is on the rise. We experience so many things differently from other cultures. We have gone through more experiences than other cultures. But I want the listeners to know you are never alone. And if you ever need someone to talk to, just go back to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number that was given at the beginning of this podcast. Now, um, a study of nearly 400,000 individuals found that skiers had a nearly 60% lower risk of anxiety disorder compared to non-skiers. In a study of college students, vaping, and more specifically, nicotine vaping was tied to a higher risk of eating disorders. Did you know certain eye conditions are related to macular degeneration, such as cataract, diabetes-related eye disease, were all tied to a higher risk for dementia? In related news, long-term exposure to road traffic noise and railway noise in Denmark also appear to increase one's risk for dementia, including Alzheimer's. A Canadian survey found that almost 70% of pregnant women were moderately to highly distress during COVID-19 pandemic, while 20% also reported depressive symptoms. That has been the latest in healthcare news. So stick with me. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of my story, Living with Lucas Podcast. Um, look, I promise to tell you about um, the results of the biopsy. Well, it was benign lymphoid tissue. Um, the specialist states that I'm not out of the woods yet. My um, right side of my neck is still swollen. Um, and more than likely, um, I will have to have surgery. You know, I've been on... Um, antibiotics and they put me on 50 milligrams of guess what prednisone but 
I took that for one day. Um, it helped. The prednisone did help to alle alleviate um, the fluid in my body. But, um, and it did um, eliminate the, um, the um, bacteria that um, it had caused. So, yes, the right side of my neck is still swollen. Um, the specialist informed me that I have to be really careful if um, for some reason that um, my nose should start um, you know, I see spots of blood and then the blood starts to profusely run out my nose. I have to go to the ER as soon as possible. Um, so the, the biopsy revealed it was um, benign lymphoid tissue, but I'm still not out of the woods. Um, he said if I experience pain again and the swelling and guess what you can tell sometimes by my voice um, the swelling still there and the pain is starting to come back so I have to make another appointment and that's why I state more than likely um, surgery will be coming um, so that's it for that. Uh, my foundation, the Charlie E. and Minnie P. Hendricks Foundation. I will be feeding those in need and the homeless on Sunday. Um, this time, um, this event is sponsored by Walmart. Walmart issued us a community grant and we thank you so much for that grant, Walmart. And in November, I will be feeding those in need along with the homeless also. And that event is sponsored by Whole Foods and we would like to thank Whole Foods for their contribution to the Charlie E. and Minnie P. Hendricks Foundation and to our endeavors of making sure no family goes hungry. And a special thank you to Bombas Socks for donating socks and making sure that no individual foot will be cold this winter. So we will be passing out socks from Bombas. September, once again, we thank Walmart for supporting us. And November, no, I'm sorry, September, October, we thank Walmart for supporting us and making sure no one in the community goes hungry and they have a meal. Before I like go, I would like to say, forget the mistakes, but remember the lesson. Always pray to have eyes that see the best, a heart that forgives the worst, a mind that forgets the bad and a soul that never loses faith. Remember, you are never alone. You always have someone to talk to. If you ever need someone to talk to, go to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The number is listed at the opening of this podcast. You are never alone. I'm Susan Hendricks for my story, Living with Lupus Podcast. 
have a most peaceful, positive, and also blessed weekend. I'll see you next week for another episode.